Hello and welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail. And my guest today is um, our Fresh Perspectives organic gardener who comes on and talks to us about it a lot, Bill Kuick. Uh, thanks for coming on again, Bill. Yes. You're such a good sport about uh, participating <laughs> a lot in fre on Fresh Perspectives. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, spring gardening. And uh, I'll let Bill get started here. Well, I, I guess, I mean, basically, I mean, it, it is early. It's still February here right now. I know you probably won't see this in February, but um, it is time to start thinking and planning, I think, for, uh, for gardening. I have uh, Johnny's selected seed catalog here. Uh, and we uh, just got a copy of it in the mail the really a week or that, so ago. I mean, I guess I, I've ordered from them since the 70s, I think, late 70s. Oh, but, wow, uh, that's a I mean, long, they, they that's a me, long time. I get, I, get, I get catalogs. I think I, I usually get about five or six. I get a couple at my office and a couple of them at Oh, a few of them at wow. home as well. So you share them with uh, oh yeah, I'll you give them away to people. People, people like, well, that can come I, can in I, for uh, massages. Well, then. you know, sometimes friends, clients, somebody somebody wants one. I, I have extras, but uh, but yeah, it's not a bad idea. I mean, especially with what's been going on the last few years, to order early, order your seeds early, especially if there's certain things. I know there's certain things like even from Johnny's. There's a, a type of soybean. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. Envy, I think, and uh, sometimes they run out. And you know, these days, uh, a lot of places are, are running out of seeds early, especially like I said, if it's a popular variety or, or, or something. And I know a couple of years ago there was problems. I think we mentioned that before with seeds. Uh, potatoes were hard to come by, and uh, I know my one friend said, "Well, I went to here and I went to there, and there's nothing available. What are you doing?" I'm like. I just went to Wegmans and bought the little potatoes, <laughs> and I just I have them sitting in I have egg cartons <laughs> on my kitchen counter, letting, yeah, them, letting yeah, them sprout ahead. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah, actually, I guess it was two years ago. A friend sold me some Kennebec potatoes, and I, I put those in. Uh, I let them sprout. Actually, I, I was having rototiller problems, tractor problems last year, and didn't get my stuff in in time. And by the time I went to plant my potatoes, believe it or not, August 5th, I had a girl help me do some, some other work and I said, you know what, before you go, can we do this one thing? And I had the, the ground all turned up and I said, just stick the shovel in. No, I, just, I stuck the shovel in, made a little divot, made a little, little hole, and I said, just drop these in. There was no potato left. It was just eyes left. That's all oh, that was there. Oh, okay. We put okay. those things in and the weather was right. Um, within like a week, I had potato plants that were already like four or six inches high. This and was I, in August? In August, yeah, August 5th. And, you know, remember we had a really, really mild, nice uh, September and October this year. And I didn't harvest them until November, but I mean, I had really nice big potatoes. And wow. I, I want to say I probably had a, just one row, maybe 50 feet. And um, I think I would say... I think I think I got like like three five gallon pailfuls of, of potatoes out of that. Some of them I didn't hill them enough because there really wasn't that that great of, of uh, uh, soil to hill in that area. I did hill some, but uh, there was a lot of green ones. So I have a grocery bag full of uh, the ones that I'll plant uh, uh, for this year. But uh, I know like a lot of people jump the gun. I think a lot on, on when it comes to tomato plants. Everybody I know people that start in January and February. But and I know we've talked about it before, but. Uh, that's one of the things you want to wait. I mean, really, five to six weeks before Memorial Day. So you figure, you know, middle to, to later April is uh, is really enough time. Uh, I do start some about eight weeks before. So say, you know, beginning of April or so. But those go into four-inch pots. So then you have a nice uh, stocky plants. I also do grow under lights, not just uh, uh, in the window or something like that. But uh, also wanted to mention that... Uh, through uh, it's uh, www.soilwater.org, uh, the Chautauqua County Soil and Water Conservation has their uh, sale going on, and it says here the deadline is April 1st. But uh, I don't know if you've ever done this, but uh, they have all different types of trees. Just for, for instance, you can get um, 10 balsam fir trees for $30. So they're like $3 a tree. You can get 25 for 63, 100 plants for 225. But uh, there's just, I mean, there's blueberry bushes, uh, raspberries, um, uh, strawberries, uh, other ornamentals, a lot of, lot of different trees. But 
Uh, very reasonable. They're small. I mean, uh, but I know I've had people laugh at me and say, "Oh, those things are getting, you're gonna, you'll be dead before they're they're even trees." But um, within you know five or six years, I've I've had to uh, uh, cut them back uh, too. There's even stuff to like maintain your ponds and uh, even apple trees for for uh, wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, very reasonable. Uh, but yeah, really, I, I I think like this time of year, it's not a bad idea as far as the garden goes. Think about planning, like what are you going to grow? How much are you going to grow? And then, you know, maybe make a map, do a, do a drawing of your garden and um, figure out how much space you have to, uh, to, uh, to plant in and then, you know, figure out, you know, what is, what is it that you really want or what things you want to grow more of and then, you know, figure out your, your spacing. Um, but um, also I was going to talk about soil test kits because I know oh, we've yeah. talked about it before. You tried to get one yeah, to I have to on the kit. program today. And yeah, I thought I'd show, I thought I'd have the, the soil here and do it all, but uh, <laughs> you had to make an appointment to buy a, a soil test kit. So just be aware that if you want a soil test kit from the lab in, in uh, Brockton there, or Portland, <laughs> uh, you have to make an appointment ahead of time uh, to get that. But. Um, <laughs> um, and then one thing too, uh, I, you look in your in your Johnny's catalog since you just had it. It's right towards the very beginning here, but a very nice, um, a little planting schedule here. Uh, and I have been to Johnny's Selected Seed. I applied for the uh, head farmer job there once years ago. Oh, did uh, you? Yeah, oh. I look at that the, the beautiful picture of the the aerial view of their the farm. But um, just for instance here, just th I think this is a really great chart. Uh, it's direct seeding, seeded vegetable crops. Well, they list beans, bush, pole, lima, shell, soy, and beets, and all these things are to be direct planted. I, I don't know if you've ever tried, but trying to, to plant beans in a greenhouse to get a little bit of a jump on the season, I mean, they, they don't transplant very well. Beets don't transplant. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but no, usually no. what happens is the beet puts out such a long taproot. By the time the beet plant is an inch tall, the roots are probably three inches tall, and usually those little cell pack things are about an inch or inch and a half deep. So your root is going to go to the bottom and start going this way. So when you transplant it, your beet is going to be like this. It's not going to oh. be a nice straight beet. Oh, oh. But you can you can uh, you know transplant those, but. But really, you know, a lot of things just do better if they're tr they're planted seeds directly, directly planted into the ground. Uh, into the ground. I wanted to ask a question about potatoes, and um, the reason is uh, we did not have potatoes in the garden a few years back. One year, for some reason, I don't remember what the reason was, mm -hmm. but um, so a few different times during the coming be before uh, before the next year's growing season, we tried potatoes from various different supermarkets. Right. And none of them seemed to be any good. What was going on there? Well, Do you I, know? That's why I always try to buy organic when it comes to potatoes because uh, I believe in New York State they can irradiate potatoes, first oh. of all. And, you know, they're nuked then. I mean, they've been put Ooh. through an x-ray, essentially, to, uh, to kill off anything. And a lot of potatoes are also sprayed with and then coated with an anti-sprouting agent. So then, you know, if you want to keep a potato for a long time, you don't want the eyes growing out. So oh. for a restaurant or something like that, they want them to not sprout. So they'll actually spray them with things. Sometimes if you let them sit long enough, and that was the thing when I did that two years ago when you couldn't get potato seed, I got, uh, they were red, white, and blue. Uh, potatoes and I, I actually those were not organic I thought they were but I want to say the red ones sprouted the white ones sprouted I never got one blue one out of a five pound bag I mean it was five pounds total mm -hmm. so you figure you know pound and three quarters or pound and two thirds or something like that didn't sprout at all um, but um, but then I did get they were just I, I bought potatoes at Wegmans they were just like Yukon Golds or, or something like mm -hmm. that and when I got them home, they were there was green on them. And I'm like, well, I could take these back to the store and get my money back. Uh -huh. but I'm just, I'm just going to keep them, and I just use those uh, for planting. But yeah, typically, uh, if you're going to try and plant them, I would try to get organic potatoes at the store. Because sometimes, and I, I've even uh, restaurant in Fredonia wanted uh, there was a certain type of potato that they were getting, and they were really good for French fries. 
And he asked me if I could grow them. I'm like, sure. I said, I can grow anything, basically. But I said, well, tell you what. What if we do this? I said, you buy the box of potatoes. He was going to buy a 50-pound box of potatoes. I said, you give them to me. I said, I'll do the work. And I said, we'll, we'll, we'll split the, the take. And um, I had my own potato seed that I had saved from, from the year before. Every one of mine grew. Not one of those 50 pounds of potatoes grew. Oh not my a gosh. single potato what a waste. out of all that. Yeah, so yeah, we, we yeah. paid for a whole 50-pound bag. And I mean, I, I did exactly what you're supposed to do. I, I cut them early so the ends dry. There's, there's a couple of different methods, too, if you want to just talk about potatoes for a minute. I mean, some people, like in conventional growing, which I don't recommend, they actually will cut the potato and they dip it in powdered captan, which is a fungicide. And that's how they'll do it. So that they say that way it'll keep the potato from rotting in the ground. Two things that I've done. One is you can cut them and then let them sit in the sun for a couple of days so they dry so it's not like a fresh, wet cut potato that you're sticking in the ground. But there is another method where you just cut them and put them right in the ground too. And I've, I've done both mm-hmm. and, uh, and they, they both work. But um, it, I, I'm not sure if I, I um, told you all this, but I, I, years ago, I mean, I used to plant potatoes and you know, May and like early June, and then I'd be harvesting potatoes in August. But mm-hmm. um, I can't remember the, the lady's name, but she owned the, uh, she and her husband had the Casadega Greenhouse. Uh-huh. And I remember as a little kid, I mean, maybe five years old, right near them, there was a guy that grew potatoes, and he would go through the field with a subsoiler, so it would just bring the potatoes to the top of the ground, and you could go out and do a pick your own potato thing. So my yeah. parents took us there. And it's it's really kind of funny, kind of ridiculous. But I think I was about five, and I was really pissed because they wouldn't let me carry the fifty pound bag of potatoes. I probably didn't weigh fifty pounds, but I wanted to carry that bag of potatoes. And they <laughs> me, so. uh, but I asked her. I said, "Hey, I said, wasn't there a guy that lived near you?" She said, "Oh, Mr. So and So." She said he had potatoes in every room in his house. He said, that's all he grew was potatoes, potatoes, potatoes. And then just as a kind of a second thought, she says he always planted his potatoes between the fourth and the eleventh of July. I'm like. July? She says, well, when you think about it, she goes, at least the ground's warmed up then. I'm just like, this doesn't make any sense. I'm July? I'm just, I just got to thinking about it. I was like, well, this guy is a professional potato grower. Mm-hmm. He seems to know what he's doing, I mm-hmm. guess. It's like, I started doing the math. It's like, well, you know, early season potatoes are 60 to 70 day, mid season are 70 to 80 day, late season are like 80 to 90 day potatoes. So if you planted any of those potatoes at the beginning of July, 60, 70 days is going to be getting into September. 70, 80 days, maybe later September. 80 to 90 days is going to be into into October, which is the perfect time to harvest your potatoes and put them into storage like the way I used to do it. I'm harvesting in August. Well, what do I do? I mean, I'd have to keep them in a the refrigerator uh, to keep them you know, being fresh. So mm-hmm. I started experimenting with it, and honestly, it has worked out phenomenal every time i've done it you know i'll still plant some early potatoes so i have some potatoes to oh, eat like yeah, maybe because, by labor day or something because like that people yeah people like to eat potato salad in the right, summer yeah right right yeah. well i've even done it in the greenhouse i don't know if you've ever seen my pictures but i used to plant i i think well i know they would be ready in early june i would have potatoes ready in early june but in the greenhouse i would plant two rows against the the side wall and then it would be that maybe march maybe like late march i think it was that I would put them in there, but um, yeah, I have pictures, they grow up really nice, but uh, they wouldn't be like big, big potatoes, but then, you know, like I would grow for restaurants, so they want the little the little red creamer potatoes, so I would uh, I would grow, you know, two like 40 foot rows right mm-hmm. next to each other in the, in the tunnel like that, and uh, typically, usually, you know, by about, about the 10th of June, middle of June or something like that, I'd have uh, a few bushels of nice potatoes that way, but, uh, yeah, I, I think, though, I, you know, just want to kind of focus on, you know, like right now, I mean, early season, if you want to start some things, you know, early that you can go out early, the cooler weather crops like lettuce, cilantro is very cold hardy, which surprises a lot of people. I've actually harvested cilantro from under snow. I, I went out in my garden, I'm like, it's here's someplace and started digging around, went through six inches of snow and the cilantro looks just as good as it did uh, before the snow hit it. But um, I, I do, I, I think, you know, I don't usually plant spinach indoors. That's another thing I direct seed. Oh, yeah. But um, yeah. that's something you can get out early. And, of course, peas, uh, too. Usually, I figure, like, right around the first day of spring, right around March 
20th, 21st, I'll try to get some spinach seed in and, and some uh, peas. Uh, peas in the ground at that time. Do fava beans too. I used to grow fava beans. I don't grow them anymore. But um, uh, the onions are, are supposed to be planted early, aren't they? Right. Yeah. I usually get plants, usually buy onion plants from, uh, from Texas. And uh, they go in fairly early. I want to say uh, they usually watch our weather and then they send them uh, accordingly. But uh, typically, I know my one friend lives up in the hills and he, he decided to order his own because I always got mine and then he'd always get a snowfall uh, afterwards. But, uh, uh, but yeah, typically I think, I think they come in April. Yeah, it's, I, I know the one year it was uh, uh, 2017, I believe it was the, uh, the Tuesday after Easter, which was like, I think like April 3rd. So it might've been about April 5th. Or, or something on those lines. And the one thing is too, sometimes these onions come from Texas and they're in a warm place and then they come here and sometimes they're like, ooh, nice day, I'm gonna plant them today. And I plant them and then it'll go down to 25 degrees that oh, night. Oh yeah, yeah. That sometimes will trigger the onion plants to think or believe that We're they've gone through a winter. And since, and since onions are biennial, they'll put out a flower top in the first oh. season. So, and that's, I did bring this, uh, this is Agrabon AG19, but this is a, a floating row cover. And mm -hmm. you can just lay this over the top of the plants, maybe sandbag the corners, or mm -hmm. even just, you know, put like a shovel full of dirt on the edge or a rock or a piece of wood. Or I, I sometimes use the metal uh, plant stakes. I actually uh, have <laughs> gone to yard sales where people are selling their, uh, their weightlifting barbells and weights oh, and stuff like that. And I, um, have, I have several of the, the 20 pound, like whatever they are, about a six foot long um, um, weight bar. So mm -hmm. um, you can sometimes pull the, I'll, I'll, have, <laughs> I'll have beds, you know, 50 to 75 feet long and I'll take that, pull it tight on the one end, put the one weight bar on it and then go to the other end, pull it tight, put the weight bar on it, cut it to length. And then you can just use metal stakes on the side if it's something that you want to uh, continue to keep checking. but. Great stuff to use, like if, if you want to plant like early beets or bro early carrots, you know, they, they sometimes take a little while to germinate, first of all, and then they're, uh, you know, s s first of all, a little bit slow to germinate, especially in cooler soils, but also the carrots, sometimes they tend to dry out. You have to almost water them every day. This actually helps to keep the moisture in, for one, but it actually heats up uh, during the daytime mm -hmm. and it gives you five to eight degrees protection at night. Uh, as well, I have, um, and I didn't, I always thought, yeah, they heat up a little bit during the day, but a couple of years ago, I had a girl helping me, and we had uh, 10 foot um, PVC hoops that I put down the bed. Mm -hmm. um, I think we were, we were covering up some tomatoes in like mid uh, May to, to protect them, and uh, there was something about like there was two sets of hoops next to each other, and usually I sandbag the corners and sandbag the edges. Um, I have nylon bags full of sand. And uh, there wasn't enough room between the two sets of hoops in the middle, so I was putting a bar on and a pipe. And so she was outside, the girl was outside helping me, and I'm inside this thing, and I got kind of used to being in this, you know, about a three and a half foot high tunnel, and I'm crawling along and getting it all ready. And when I came out of there, I was like, wow, it must be 15 degrees warmer inside of this, this material yeah, than it was yeah. you know, just outside. I mean, so it might have been 50 outside, it was 65 uh, in there. So, you know, if you just lay it down on the soil, even if it's not billowed up, uh, you know, warms up 15 degrees warmer than ambient temperature that might help your, uh, your germination um, just a little bit too. But I use it on uh, a lot of crops too, just for um, pest protection because it's oh, an actual yeah, physical yeah. barrier. I was just thinking that when you were mentioning the uh, beets and the carrots because Carl was having trouble last year. He uh, planted beets and carrots and something was going under, get, something was underground oh, eating the yeah. darn things. That's, that's, see, that's my catch 22 too. The, the deer will come and start eating the leaves off them and then they, they, deer don't really, their teeth don't cut. They more like grind. And so they'll go to, to take a beet stem and you know, they're kind of tough. They'll pull the beets right out of the ground. So they're oh. not really 
eating your beet, but they're eating the green tops. So then you put the row cover over them, and then I have voles, I have field mice that get underneath. If, if they're not exposed to where cats can get to them, or, or hawks, or owls, uh -huh. or whatever, uh -huh. they, they... Then they'll, they, they'll go and finish off the yeah. vegetables. Right, yeah, they'll get the, the roots. I mean, I've, I've had them eat habanero peppers, and people are like, oh man, my do gosh. you think, I mean, don't you, like... The, the, the moles do that? Yeah, vole, it's not a mole, it's a vole, vole. it's a field mouse, because voles, field and mouse. moles are actually carnivorous. Moles will eat uh, grubs and uh, and worm earthworms, but uh, voles are the the field mice, and they'll they'll get your your vegetables. But yeah, they'll eat they eat peppers. If the tomato's near the ground, they'll eat a tomato. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, and then, like I said, even even the hot peppers. But yeah, carrots. I mean, they'll they'll nibble nibble around the edge of the carrot. The potatoes are actually the worst thing. I mean, I I've, I've pulled up. Uh, uh, you know, stalks as big as my thumb or as big as my fingers, thinking like, oh, I'm going to have like nine nice big tomato potatoes. I'm like, there's no, there's nothing here. And you oh, okay. and I, I use I use straw as a mulch on my potato hills, and uh, I dig down in there. And I start digging in, and I find my straw is like a nest all amongst the potatoes. So I think it's like, boy, they really got it made. They're uh, in underground with this straw bed for for them to, to rest on. And nice and dry and fluffy, and they have all these potatoes all around them. And I, I literally, out of a whole plant of a uh, big plant, potato plant, I got one potato, and there was just like the skins of the other potatoes were there. They've they've gotten to the the big Lutz beets like this big. Like I don't know why they look a little wilty on a on a hot summer day like that. I, I mean, I'm, they're well watered, really you know, rich compost soil and. You go and dig them up, and they bore a hole about this big in the bottom, and they hollowed out the whole beet. So it looks like a beet, but there's nothing inside of it. It's, it's hollow. They eat the whole inside of it out. But um, yeah, yeah, that's he he was really not happy about that. Exactly. Uh, something's been eating my beets and my carrots that I planted. He's going. You know, you were talking about mulching. Um, I remember once upon a time. I think it was back in the early 1980s or something like that. We got Organic Gardening Magazine for mm -hmm. a while, and there was this this elderly lady uh, that would write articles for Organic Gardening Magazine, mm -hmm. and um, her name was Ruth Stout. Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah, remember. yeah. Ruth Stout, no work gardening. Yeah. And somebody got a video for us to watch one time. Um, we were in a food buying club, you okay. know, we, yep. a group of people that would um, buy food from a health food yeah. uh, distributor. And we'd get together once a month for dinner, and at one of our dinners one time, um, somebody was showing this video about Ruth Stout, you know, working in her garden, and mm -hmm. she was really big time into... Uh, Composting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She just put compost over everything. Yeah, and and she just in the video she was just showing how to plant potatoes. She goes, well, I just move some of this straw out of the way and and just put some of these potatoes, you know, these sprouted potatoes in there and and then cover it back up with a bunch of more straw. And she goes, most people would never think of planting potatoes like that. But she goes, but I do it this way because it makes the makes it easier, mm -hmm. you know. It's a lot less work. It was it was pretty interesting. Well, I know she she always did use a lot of compost or a lot of mulch on top of everything. Mm -hmm. And I know like even if she said, well, you know, there's a big weed over there. Well, instead of going over there with a shovel and trying to dig it out, she would just take a flake of hay and lay it right on top of it and snuff it out. <laughs> but I know that I don't know if this is necessarily true. I heard a lot of people in Vermont uh, when I was up there say that they didn't really prefer her method because with so much mulch, so much compost and mulch on top that it didn't let allow the soil to warm up quick enough. But um, I don't know if that's yeah, I, um, really an, that much of an issue. I mean, I've never really done exactly what she did, but I do know uh, a guy that I knew in, in Ohio, his dad was a biology professor at uh, Akron, uh, Akron University, and he would do a thing where he would, he had maybe three or foot, four foot wide growing areas but then he'd have a three or four foot wide, you know, walking path, and every year the walking paths he would just layer and layer and layer with all kinds of organic matter, and then the next year he would grow to tell that in, he would grow there, and then he would mulch oh, the other I stuff. See. So he had, you know, he was doing so kind of root stout, but he yeah. was also just kind of rotating onto, you know, where there was a lot of material. 
put down. He also, I used to go and get manure from him because he had, he had horses, pigs. I think they had a cow. I know they were, they were into the thing where they would um, order, they had an incubator and they would order eggs of different exotic birds and stuff. And so I, I, they, I mean, they had pheasants, they had, you know, the big, not, not fe- uh, peacocks. Oh, peacocks. peacocks. He had, he had uh, you know, Chinese pheasants. They had a lot of it. So, you know, there was some, some other various bird uh, manures also uh, mixed in with uh, um, the, the, the stuff that I got from him. But, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, I, I guess, you know, different, different ways of looking at it. I mean, I don't really, and sometimes here too, I find, you know, a lot of people are oh, all about their mouths, all about their mouths, but it's like, yeah, but what if we have a really, really wet season? I mean, you kind of want it to dry out yeah. uh, a little bit too. And I, I've actually seen it, and I had someone questioning me, it's about, well, sometimes when it's really, really dry, and, and you've probably noticed this, when you have a really, really droughty season, and you've got, you know, even three inches of straw on top of that. Well, if you get a couple of tenths of an inch of rain, you pull the mulch back, it didn't even reach the soil. It, the, the mulch absorbs it. So, right. you know, to me, it's like, yeah, mulch is good, but it sometimes, you know, it, it can be too much. I mean, it'll just keep things wet. Now, I don't know, you plant garlic, right? Carol does, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I always mulch that, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, number of reasons. I, I think, first of all, I mean, it, it moderates the, the soil moisture, so it's not going to dry out uh, a, as quickly. And um, it also moderates soil temperature. If you've got, you know, uh, let's say a 90-degree day uh, and the sun's hitting right on that soil, it's going to heat the soil up. The bulbs of the garlic are probably going to get to... 85 degrees on a, on a 90 degree day but if you've got you know even four inches of straw on top of that if you know the the the, the root temperature of the the garlic probably isn't going to change by maybe a degree or two so it helps to moderate that and of course all that where the interface between the the, the mulch and the soil is that's breaking down the mulch that's also going to feed the uh, uh the garlic too but uh, i don't know if i told you this but i i actually used to always harvest my garlic, cut off the roots, cut off the, the stems, clean them, and then I would either compost or, or burn the, the stalks just, just to get rid of them. But um, I want to say this is going to be my fourth season where uh, it, it's called biological growing. And mm-hmm. when you think about it, I mean, if there was garlic growing in nature, nobody's going and digging it up and mm-hmm. transplanting it into a new area that didn't have garlic in it. And the debris is going right back into the soil, right where they grow, because the tops fall down. Mm-hmm. It goes right there, and um, so with the biological method, you grow your garlic in the same place year after year after year. And the one guy that I read his article, he said, he said, you know, he said when I started putting the the, the debris from the garlic back into the soil, that's when everything really, really kicked in the gear. So uh, this will be my fourth year and of, of doing it in the same place but my third year of adding the um, um, the material back into the soil. Now last year was I think a better year. I think part of it was the first two years I didn't really add that much compost uh, to the to as much compost to the soil but the last um, this past season and the season before lots of compost, uh, Jersey green sand and uh, limestone and last year was probably one of my better better crops uh, at least out of the last few I've been experimenting uh, mm-hmm. with uh, with planting in the same place I do usually I am kind of a stickler believer in, in rotating crops so I'll try to not grow anything in the same place within a three-year period and uh, and people you know ask me how to keep track and it, it's actually fairly simple in a notebook I'll draw like all of my garden beds let's say it's like oh, one yeah. two three yeah. four five down the list and then I'll say, okay, this was carrots, this is your beets, garlic, you know, whatever, all the way down. Well, you know, if you just like flip the page and you had carrots in row one, put carrots in row two, and then you take whatever's at the end and move it to the beginning. Uh-huh. So if you keep on rotating like that, yeah, you know, you yeah. might have, I, I've actually gone in some cases gone like six years before something goes back into the into the same ground uh, that it was planted. And, and, it, and I've seen... The difference with like brassicas, especially I, one one year, I uh, my fields were three. My one field was well, I had three three hundred foot by fifty foot fields, 
And initially I was growing across, so I had 50 foot long beds. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, well, I mean, it just would make more sense to have 300 foot long beds and less of them instead of having all these 50 foot beds. Well, kind of hard to keep your crop rotations when you were growing this way and now you're growing this way. So mm -hmm. it was really funny because I was like, well, what am I gonna do? I guess I plant the same stuff. Even with, with good compost, good fertilizer and everything, the plants like bok choy, baby bok choy, went in the ground, it was this big. A week later, it was smaller if it was grown where brassicas had been grown the year oh, before. The oh, soil was yeah. just that depleted. Whereas like right next to it, and I know a lot of people say, oh, you gotta get rid of that one. That's diseased or that one's not doing good. But it's really the soil because the one right next to it would be doing fantastic. Mm -hmm. And you know, they were like, you know, maybe a foot, foot and a half apart. So um, sometimes it's, uh, it, it, it does make a difference. Um, as far as nutrients go, as far as uh, doing, uh, getting that out. But another thing I, I, I thought too wouldn't be a, uh, bad to talk about is, you know, it's, it's a little early yet, but if you do want to start stuff inside, uh, it'd be good if you could bring some compost into the house now, you know, get a couple, if we have a warmer day, you can get to your compost, bring, bring in a couple of buckets so you have uh, stuff ready for planting. And um, also uh, seedling trays, just have your seedling trays and your pots and stuff ready. Um, just to, to start. So I guess really, I guess what I'm saying is just that this is a good time of year to be planning uh, for your garden. So, so make your map, uh, you know, pick out what you think you're, you're going to want to grow. And uh, you can even, you know, come up with, like I said, this in, in that Johnny's catalog, they tell you what you can plant outdoors, uh, you know, direct seeded. And uh, you can, uh, from there, um, you know, make a plan as to like when, you know, if the weather is decent at that time of year. This is when I'm going to plant this. And then, of course, you know, get your, your garden soil, you know, prepped. And I already, like last fall, I have uh, dump truck loads of, of compost. So I, uh, I've i spread on, uh, oh, I, I, I want to say one, two, well, I got my garlic done. And then there's a bed, one bed on one side and two beds on the other side of those. Those are about like 35 foot long beds. So I have three beds, rototill you know, just perfectly ready to plant anytime I'm ready there. So the compost was added, the limestone was added, Jersey green sand was added. So the soil is prepped and rototilled. So, I, you know, I'll go over it one more time in case there's any small weeds in it before I plant. And then in another area where the potatoes were, uh, the potato bed and on either side of those, so I have three, I think those are 75 foot long beds there. Those are, are ready to go. And then uh, in another spot I have, uh, more compost that I brought in. And at the end of the season too, I, I had all this compost and um, I did a really, really nice cleanup job on my asparagus last year. Um, so we, we actually went through and just weed whacked all the weeds off it. Weed whacked the asparagus down because it was getting a little bit weedy. I should have flamed it uh, earlier, but layered probably six inches of compost all the way down the top of the bed uh, actually added a, a Vertrell uh, uh, dry granular organic fertilizer first, then the compost on top of that, and then laid flakes of hay all the way down the sides of it and kept it really clean. But then um, end of the season, I put another layer of compost over the top of that because I think I, I know I've mentioned this, I believe on the show before, but something that you can do to get two crops out of the same patch is uh, with asparagus is plant strawberries in between the asparagus. So the oh. asparagus has deep, deep roots, like those big uh, crowns under the ground. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, strawberries are very shallow rooted, so you can grow them in the same same bed. So now I have this bed that's crowned and it has all this nice compost on the top. So uh, I'll be ordering strawberry plants and planting those in there this spring. But another thing too about those, I, I'd been thinking this uh, relative to uh, like tree planting and, and you know growing uh, fruit trees um, a lot of people are getting really excited that first year they plant those strawberries they're just waiting for that first strawberry but oh yeah oh, if yeah. you can be a little more patient the best thing to do when you plant strawberry plants is pluck out all the flowers before they mature into a fruit oh, the first year because oh, yeah. then you get a nice hearty plant so the way I look at it and I've, I've seen this happen the first year you let them go, maybe you'll get three strawberries off of each plant. Mm -hmm. Well, then the next year you think, well, I did pretty good. I got six or seven strawberries off that same plant the second year. However, if you plucked all those flowers off the first year and let it build a big plant and didn't 
weaken itself to, to, to form those fruit, you could get a quart of strawberries in the second year and then they're going to spread and you'll get a lot, a lot more in the next year. So if you can just sacrifice that first year, it really does make a big difference. But I know uh, it was funny because uh, peach trees, I had soil that was good for peaches where I lived in Forestville, sandy, gravelly soil. So I read up on it. I ordered this bag of, it was humates mixed with like rock minerals, the perfect thing for, for planting uh, a fruit tree. I dug a probably a six foot by three foot deep hole, filled that in with compost, put my peach tree in there, put the rock minerals and the humates in there, trimmed it up, and I didn't get any fruit the first mm -hmm. year. And then I'm like, well, you know, that's okay. And the second year, same thing. The way I trimmed it, the way I tended to it, nothing. And uh, my friend Tom tells me, he went to Walmart, he bought a peach tree and just dug a hole and stuck it in the ground. Yeah, I only got 12 peaches the first year. I'm like, you got 12 peaches. <laughs> so yeah, I got like, <laughs> he got 50 the second year. I'm like, I think I hear I'm trying to do everything right and I haven't gotten a single peach. Well, in the third year, there was so many peaches on this tree that I went through and it was, actually I talked to Peggy Fitzgibbon about it. Oh, did you? I, said, well, I pulled about 75 peaches off and she goes, ah, you might need to pull more than that. I'm reading through my backyard orchardist and I'm like, I know somewhere near they tell you how to fruit prune, like how much fruit to take off. I eventually found that part of the chapter and it said that you shouldn't have more than one peach every six to eight inches on this on the on the on the on the branch oh I'm like, i've got clusters of two, of two oh, and three yeah, yeah. every four inches <laughs> i went through that i pulled a bucket full of like ping pong sized peaches off that tree and i swear in a week the other peaches went from the size of a ping pong ball to like the size of a small peach in one week <coughs> i must have taken maybe 275 peaches off of that tree and i had i mean nice nice big super super ripe peaches i think i harvested five and a half bushels of peaches oh, off of one tree off of one tree the first wow. year and that's what the the woman who wrote the book said she goes you're not going to get fruit your first second maybe not even your third season with my method she goes but what i'm trying to get you to do is build a big root system so your tree will support a big crop of peaches so I don't know if he ever got more than, you know, a couple hundred peaches off his. I think I got, you know, like I said, it was like almost six bushels that, that first season. Wow. So, um, you know, similarly with, with strawberries and uh, things like that. And sometimes, you know, the, the, the plant puts so much energy into producing the berry or the fruit and the seed to propagate itself again another year that um, it, it depletes the plant. I mean, it really does uh, weaken the plant um, mm. to a, uh, a certain degree. But... Um, another thing, I don't know if we can talk about this, but I brought the oh, Field yeah. and Forest yeah, uh, catalog. And, uh, you know, a great time of year, too, to think about if you're, you know, maybe maybe you've got a tree that needs to come down uh, on your property. And uh, you could easily, and that's w w actually one of the years that I did uh, at a really great uh, shiitake crop. It was uh, coming up on Christmas, the week before Christmas, and I had a huge hard maple tree that went up about, 10 feet and it's split into two branches. Oh, well, it must be oh. over the years, water getting between the two trunks oh, rotted oh. it a little bit in there. Oh, and in yeah. a windstorm, one of these big halves of the tree fell across my driveway. Right. And uh, I had to have a tree service guy come in and you know kind of clean it up for me. But, um, you know, it was just, you know, it was Christmas time. But then, you know, I was like thinking, well, the tree was cut in the dormant season. And I've got all these limbs and stuff here. So I took everything that was maybe two and a half inches to maybe six inch logs and I cut them into sections, drilled them and uh, filled them with, with uh, um, shiitake mushroom spawn and probably cost me about $25 for the spawn. And I did those in the spring of 2013. And I do have pictures. The, the logs were just loaded. I mean, I must have gotten 20, 25 mushrooms off of each log, and I had like 28 logs or something like that out of it. So, you know, it, it, it just, and I know a lot of people, I've had people even on, on some of the, the mushroom Facebook pages asking if uh, they, well, would, couldn't you just like drill a hole into a live tree and then put the plug in? It's like, well, first of all, a tree has a natural resistance to mold while it's alive. 
And they, they're like, well, couldn't you just find a tree that's almost going to die? I'm like, boy, if you can figure that one out. Go ahead, I guess. But then, you know, what do you do? I mean, you can only plug it as high as you can reach, and the tree goes up maybe 50 feet up in the air. I mean, the mushrooms aren't going to grow up above, but uh, I, I've never heard that, that of doing that type of method. But, I mean, you could even, like, with a bigger round tree, anything like a, a 12 inches or bigger round, you can do the totem stack where you buy the spawn, and usually I take a cup, like a measuring cup. I'll put one measuring cup of the spawn in the bottom of a garbage bag, usually a tall contractor bag. Spread that around. If you have a log, maybe, like I said, foot around or, or bigger, maybe 30, 36 inches long, you cut the first section off that log and you set it into the bag on top of that spawn. Another cup of spawn on top of that. The next log section, and then you usually put a cap piece on top of maybe a three or four inch piece, there's more spawn than that piece. And then actually it wasn't until 2020, uh, what I had been doing was putting another cup of spawn on top, spreading it, which is what the method was. Uh, but then you take newspaper or a brown paper bag over the top of that, tie it on, and then you bring the bag up around and you tie it off so that it's all you know, within that bag. And, um, and then you just let it incubate like that. And if it's shiitake, you probably want to wait a year Oyster mushrooms, depending on the type of wood, you know, maybe a month or two. But um, uh, so you, you just want to keep it keep it still. But what uh, my friend, who I actually got him interested in growing mushrooms, he said, "Well, didn't you see that that thing where he said they're just taking another thin slab of wood and putting it on top of them?" Like, wait, excuse me, what? And so I just take like about maybe a half inch piece of the same log, the last cut, and mm -hmm. set that on there and then bring the bag up so you don't have to, because actually when you put the paper on or the bag on, then you have to tie it with string. It's, 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 it takes a, quite a bit more time and work to do that. Yeah. Whereas if you can just take a little yeah. slab of wood, put it on top, and, it, and, you know, and it's all wood now, so you're not adding uh, paper to the, uh, to the right, whole mix. So right. I do like that um, better. But yeah, this field and forest, uh, they actually have I mean, there, there are literally, what, one, two, three, four, I guess there's four, wait, five pages of just shiitake mushroom strains. So there's, uh, I mean, there's, there's cold weather varieties, there's warmer weather varieties, there's, like, the one that I, I grow is called WR46, and the WR stands for wide range, so it will fruit at a wide range of, of temperatures. Oh, oh um, I see. But... Uh, yeah, so, uh, and then, you know, they have, I mean, there's probably 25 different types of oyster mushrooms in here. There's lion's mane, chestnut mushrooms, reishi. I did try reishi last year. Our climate is a little bit iffy oh, for it. And uh, uh -huh. I have, I think I have about 12 or 13 logs that were drilled and filled. And then I have one totem stack and uh, did not get one reishi mushroom oh. off of any of that last year. But, you know, you don't know. It could, they could come. Um, down the way. You're over in Fredonia. Uh, um, I'm thinking uh, is like over here in the Mayville area, um, would people have good results over this way too for Well, growing? probably not with, with Reishi, but I mean, I mean, um, um, uh, Steve and Julie up at uh, the Heron, they they grow they're growing a lot of shiitake up there. Oh, do they? And they even pick in the winter time sometimes because they get some oh, of those cold right? cold weather strains. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. I was telling a friend of mine that I was coming up here today. I said, "Well, he said this is kind of like the snow capital of the county here in, in Mayville." Uh, <laughs> I know. Although I know a lot of years, like Sherman and Stockton and like that, have got get a lot worse weather. Oh yeah, than well yeah, Sherman is. is probably more yeah. so than here. But, <laughs> but you know, I, I know like the 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 lighthouse down here. They used to keep track of how many inches of snow, and I'd go in there in the in the summer when I was working at Chautauqua, when they'd have like, you know, it was like twenty five feet of snow this this past winter. They would, they would keep <laughs> keep keep track of it, but uh, yeah, they keep a sign up in uh, the village park here in Mayfield. Do they? Do? they oh, that's right. They have seen that. Where yep. they uh, change it from day to day as the um, as we get snow, you know, to say how much we've gotten so far this right. year. And you know, another idea, just you know, because I I'm looking into this too. But like, like if you know anybody, like if you wanted to do mushrooms, if you want to do like even a few like mushroom like, and typically like you think, oh, you know, you got to drill it and all that. But if you did the totem stacks, 
usually like one bag of spawn, and there's different sizes, but the, if you get the big bag of spawn, which is like five and a half pounds, if you had three logs that were about like this and like that, you, that would be enough for, for, to start with, uh, with one bag of spawn. Typically, you do get about 25 or 30 smaller logs if you're doing the drill and fill. You get a lot more out of it, but it is a lot more work uh, that way, too, and you, you do have to um, have a way to drill them. Mm-hmm. But um, the, um, the, that totem stack method is pretty easy, but one thing is, is like, like, like I said, I mean, maybe your neighbor's cutting down a tree. Maybe you're going by someplace and you see, like, hey, those tree service guys are taking down that perfectly good tree over there, and just say, hey, could you throw a couple of those in the back of the truck? And I, now, my one friend, two friends that are in uh, tree service, I, I've asked them, and I've gone over, and literally they're like, take whatever you want, and they'll even help you load it in. And I've even had uh, my one friend uh, came over with his crane and dropped off logs at my house. I'm not saying that that's what everybody needs to do, is have their friend with a crane drop off huge logs, but, I mean, there's <laughs> ways to get there's ways to get logs for, yeah. for, for cultivating mushrooms. And I never even thought of this, but last year... I did up a bunch of logs, and there was a, a friend of mine from uh, Boston, New York, and she was interested, but for some reason they couldn't come the day that I was doing it, but they said, hey, well, would you sell us a log? I'm like, well, I, yeah, I, I guess, sure. She's like, how much? I'm like, I saw some online that were like $30, $30 a log. I'm like, that doesn't seem like a lot of money for, I mean, because I don't think a you know, 30, 40 inch mushroom log. Well, when you read the fine print, it was an eight-inch log for thirty dollars. <laughs> so I said, I said twenty-five dollars a log, and uh, well, she and a friend bought almost five hundred dollars worth of logs oh for me gosh. last last spring. And then she <laughs> sent another friend to me like towards the end of the summer. And I think she bought a, a pile more. I'm like, I just never really thought about it. You never but, really thought about. But then they're all excited. <laughs> they send me pictures of their all their mushrooms are growing out of it, mm-hmm. out of their their logs, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I mean, uh, it, it's not that hard. I mean, it's not not a. I mean, I know for some people, I know for me, it wasn't like intuitive to uh, you know how they how they grow or anything like that. But I did start in 2010 after I took the course. But uh, and that's www.fieldfieldforest.net is uh, is their catalog. I mean, I, I do do a lot with uh, fungi.com with uh, Paul Stamets, but. These guys have these are the, this guy is actually a student of Stamets as well, oh, oh, and yeah, they both yeah. kind of promote each other. But yeah. Stamets has more mushroom related stuff and more oh. medicinal mushroom oh, extracts, oh, I see. whereas um, these guys are more about like these are more like for farmers or people who want to grow uh, mushrooms. I mean, they do have some books and stuff like that too, but uh, uh, Field and Forest has uh, has more. So. Uh, we are down to 10 minutes. Okay. Um, did you want to talk about any of these things? That well, I don't know. Got? I just sort of brought this. I mean, I, I brought the, the garden hod so everybody could see that. But this, this is supposed to be for harvesting, and it's really nice. It's Johnny Selected Seed uh, thing. And this is actually the, the, the mesh is metal, and they uh, make these in Maine out of the same mesh that they make um, um, lobster uh, traps oh, uh, out of, oh, but I it's see. a nice, nice heavy duty thing. It's nice for harvesting. It's got the mesh in it. You could put whatever vegetables you want in it. You could literally rinse through the mesh with a, with a hose, so you don't have to bring all the dirt uh, into your house. But I, and you know, just like just just so people have an, an idea, like when you're buying big amounts of seeds, they don't just come in in, in little packets uh, like like these. Which this is this is an encore uh, lettuce mix. But uh, this is a package of beets. Uh, this is turnips. These are uh, cilantro, and I know I did mention to you that uh, I know you you said that you and Carl like that uh, black black crim tomato, tomato, and uh, yes. these are all of the uh, heirloom tomato seeds I saved uh, from this season, which I guess I have six or seven varieties. I, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of each if uh, if you want. I know at the end of the show, but uh, definitely can give you some some black crim. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess I mean you know I guess my my main thing to, to say is like get get thinking about your garden early and uh, making uh, making your plans. This is these are carrot seeds, by the way. Uh, but uh, you know make a plan, map out your uh, your garden as to like how much you want to grow of uh, uh, which things. So I, this is a corn seed. Uh, 
Uh, so I have a plan to use my oldest garden to uh, plant a garden just for the deer. So I'm thinking corn, soybeans, beets, and that's where the, the, the purple globe uh, turnips are going to go into uh, as well. But uh, yeah, and like I said, it, it, you know, really spreading compost this time of year isn't a bad idea. If you haven't put lime in your garden, it's a little bit late for this season, but if you even be put in now, it'll start to affect the soil by the end of the season. You'll be, uh, you know, better off next year. Um, I, again, even though the soil tests are a little bit of a hassle to get, might not be a bad idea if you haven't ever had one. And I, I don't know if you've ever done one, but they, they will, it's, it's really good. It's through Cornell. Um, if you know how to take the soil test kit, and that's what I was going, or how to take the test, uh, it's actually easier if you take the soil to them and then buy the kit, pay for it, put the put the soil in the bag. It's there's a twist tie, and then there's a little, um, what are they? Uh, it's like a drawstring cloth bag that the plastic bag goes into, and then the last I knew it was twenty five dollars per test. But you have a form that you fill out, and you write down everything that you plan on growing in that soil and they will send you, it takes a couple of weeks, but they will send you an analysis of everything that's in your soil, your pH, your organic content, uh, how much nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, everything that's in your soil. And then they give you specific recommendations how to bring that soil up to where it needs to be, either by adding more compost, cover cropping, uh, adding you know more, more fertilizer, whatever you need to um, increase the, uh, the fertility or the the nutrients in that soil so i do think it's a good idea uh like i said it, it was to me it was a little bit of a hassle I, I went there to pick one up and the door was locked and there were people there but it said that you needed to make an appointment to uh to get your uh, uh, anything anything from them which uh um hmm. I, I guess you know with the pandemic they're being careful but uh um mm -hmm. you know uh, the, the door was locked so i guess you have to call and make an appointment or i think there's a uh email too where you can make an appointment to, to go there and it's right there in on route 20 just outside of portland uh, but uh, that was my plan for today was to have one to to show but uh but yeah so uh you know really i guess i'm, I'm just saying you know plan plan ahead make your map get an idea of, of what you're going to grow how you're going to grow it and uh you know, again, too, with that schedule in, in the Johnny's uh, catalog, just like you can kind of make plans. And usually I think to myself, like I said, peas and, and um, spinach maybe uh, late March. But as the soil warms up, I, I don't know if you know this, but you can actually, beets can go in a little bit before carrots typically because I, oh, I think they'll, right? they'll germinate in slightly cooler <laughs> soil. And, and that's the thing about carrots is like, they can take up to three weeks to germinate in uh, in cooler soil, but again, with a lot of these things too, is is like what I what I do a lot of times too is is I can get like if I plant early cilantro or early radishes, let's say let's say I plant early cilantro in this bed, well after maybe six weeks or so, and if I planted it early, let's say in April, let's say I planted it in the middle of April, middle of April, middle of May, by the middle of June, it's done. I had more compost, I turn in the, the cilantro, I could plant radishes in there. Well, certain radishes are done within a month, 28 days, so now it's the middle of July, that bed is empty again, I could add more compost to it and you know, possibly plant, uh, you know, in, in mid-July, I mean, I could plant potatoes uh, in that, that same soil or even, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I'll do it with zucchini. I'll plant, you know, zucchini around Memorial Day and then, you know, which, okay, so you'd say like end of May, beginning of June, but, you know, maybe six weeks later, the middle of, middle of July, I'll plant another set. So, you know, they're just coming in in maybe early September, but the plants are vigorous, they're healthy, they're, you know, they have a lot of energy, so they'll put out a nicer quality fruit than the ones that are, the plants that are getting older. Um, so I, I do like to, to and, I, and again, I wouldn't plant something in the same family, same plant family. Like I wouldn't plant, let's say, um, radishes and then go to arugula and then cabbage or something like that. You don't want to plant something in the same family of plants every every rotation. You want to, you know, give it a couple of years in between between those. But um, 
uh, you know, you can get multiple crops out of the out of the same little little patch of soil. Like I said, even if you just planted radishes early, the radishes are, are done in a month. You plant some lettuce in there. Baby lettuce might be done in, you know, five or six weeks, and then uh, you know you could plant cilantro in there too. You could get cilantro af after lettuce, or even like plant a fall crop of spinach in the in the same place. But I know the one thing, and I've, I've mentioned this probably before, but uh, Elliot Coleman says that if you're going to do that kind of planting where you plant early every time you plant for every 30 inch wide bed 10 feet long it's just one five gallon bucket full of, of compost so oh, okay. it's not like you have to lay i usually layer it pretty thick like once once a season and i'll try to add a little bit more but that will give you the nutrients that that new crop needs if you know some of the mm -hmm. old stuff was mm -hmm. uh, was taken up but um one thing we've had a lot of trouble with, with in recent years is that tomato blight. Right. Is there anything that can be done to prevent that? I know that some people spray copper. I think it is a heavy metal, but it does actually work. Um, I actually think neem, the, the neem is pretty oh, neem. Oh, is neem that is right? A, neem? I, I think oh. if you, but you have to, you have to get it early. I mean, it, it will work as a, as a preventative, but Honestly, I know a lot of people say, oh, you've got to dig your soil down three three feet deep, get rid of all that soil and add new soil. So I was like, oh, that would be like impossible oh, okay. for me to do. But okay. I do have to say, I know that in 2004, we had a really, really wet season where I was in um, Forestville and I had 33 tomato plants. I didn't even get 11 tomatoes that year. So oh, it took me my. three plants for each tomato. Oh, and they weren't like really, really good either. And I had that, uh, what's the late blight. Because early blight is not as, as it, the plants will still produce. They just don't produce that much. But that late blight, that's the same fungus that was the tomato blight in, in, uh, in Ireland uh, back in whatever it was, the 1800s. So oh. it, it, it will decimate, and that's the one thing you got to watch for too. Is sometimes the potatoes will actually have the disease and spread it to your uh, oh uh, the tomatoes. potatoes will spread but, it to the tomatoes right. And then, okay. but the thing was too though that year in '04 we had a big problem with it, but we had dry seasons after that, and it, I never got it again. 2004, yeah. five, six, or seven. Yeah. After um, that. So how do you use the neem? Uh, just uh, just mix it up. I I have what's called Einstein oil, and it's 100 percent pure organic cold pressed uh, neem, oil. neem oil and okay. uh, it's like a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon or to half a teaspoon to two teaspoons of that to a quart of warm water and uh, and actually I put a little bit of dish soap in there because it helps it to stick a little bit better oh, oh, and I just see. shake that up and just you go you really need to spray the entire plant the leaves the undersides of the leaves and the uh, Oh, okay. Stems, too. So you don't spray it in the ground when you plant the seed? No, no just plant, on the actual foliage. Just on the plant, plant. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, well, we have come to the end of another episode of Fresh Perspectives. Thank you so much for uh, coming on again. And well, Bill's going to be on in another month again. Thanks for having me. And we're going to do an episode on the dangers of um, using toxic gardening products. And um, I'll see the rest of you in the viewing audience on the next episode. <laughs>